so for this uh, webinar here, we're going to talk about airworthiness requirements. Things like task B of the pre-flight preparation areas of operation, something like that in the private pod ACS. Uh, but yeah, let's get started here. So just for you those who don't know me, my name is Wesley Chin, I'm CFI at the Princeton Flying School, and I've been teaching here since last October. I also did all my certificates and ratings all at Princeton. So you can see in this uh, picture over here, there's me in 2013 holding the folder with my intro gift certificate ready to hop into Mike Charlie over there. Uh, so I'm not flying. I'm currently studying finance at the Rutgers Business School, and I also teach piano and saxophone at a local music school. All right. So in terms of the content for today, we're going to start off by defining and determining airworthiness. So kind of just making sure to clear up what that word actually means. We'll talk about what the components of airworthiness are, who is responsible for all that stuff. And then we're going to go into the various components that make up an airplane's airworthiness. So, you know, like required documentation on board. Um, we'll talk about required inspections that have to be done, different equipment that has to be on board, depending on if it's like VFR day or nighttime. And we'll also go over inoperative equipment. So like, you know, for example, you find something broken during your pre-flight. How do we kind of approach that? So we'll talk about dealing with that in our airplane. Um, we'll take a break for questions and time permitting, I've got uh, 10 or so written test questions all related to this topic that we can go over as well. All right, so we'll get started here, defining and determining airworthiness. So very important thing to understand here, um, the FAR 91.7 states that no person may operate a civil aircraft unless it is in an airworthy condition. So we have to make sure we're clear though on what airworthy actually means. And to do so, we've got to take a look at different documentation, inspections, and equipment to determine if the airplane is actually airworthy, right? So there's two main components or factors that we want to discuss when we're talking about airworthiness of an aircraft. Uh, the first one is that the aircraft conforms to its type certificate. So what exactly is a type certificate? So it's a document given by the FAA and it's issued to the aircraft manufacturer. So for example, uh, Cessna Aircraft Company or their Textron nowadays, right? They hold a type certificate for their Cessna 172 airplane. Um, so what comes along with this type certificate is a data sheet called the type certificate data sheet. We're gonna to refer to that as the TCDS. So the TCDS is a document and it really kind of is like a formal description of all the components of the airplane. So the airframe, the engine, and the propeller. And it lists all these different specifications, limitations, and conditions that are required for type certification. Um, so all of these data sheets are available on the FAA website. So I'm going to click this link here. We can take a look at them. So this takes me to FAA.gov slash aircraft. Um, if I scroll down, there's a tab for technical information. And right here is type certificate data sheets. So we'll click this. And over here, you can actually search up the different TCDS sheets by make and model. So if we want to find one for our airplane, we'll just uh, search up Cessna 172 and press go. And it'll pop up right here. We'll look at the first one. All right. So this actually popped up into a uh, separate window over here. I'm going to make it show as a tab. Okay. Can you guys see this? All right, sweet. So I'll click the actual file and a PDF now will pop up of that type certificate data sheet. Um, so as you can see here, it's issued by the Federal Aviation Administration, the FAA, for all these different models of 172 airplanes and a type certificate holder is Textron Aviation, which is the company that sells the Cessna aircraft nowadays. So let's see if we can go take a look at the information related to the R model, 172R. So we'll uh, find that here. And here it is. So this is model 172R Skyhawk. And there's all these different things that are listed under it. So there's the type of engine it's got to have, the fuel, um, engine limitations, propeller, propeller limits, all these different things. You got airspeed, center of gravity range. So I'm not going to you know, go through every single one of these. But basically, what we have to understand with the TCDS, in order for the airplane to be airworthy, it's got to conform to whatever that's written in there. So all these kind of like specifications and conditions have to be complied with in order for the airplane to conform to its type certificate. So again, that's the first factor that will determine aircraft airworthiness, confirmation to the type certificate. So the second factor, this is going to relate to your pre-flight inspection. 
So the second factor is that the airplane must be in safe condition for operation. So that directly relates to your pre-flight inspection, which everybody should be doing, right? You know, you're checking for wear, any problems, structural damage amongst the aircraft, all those different things on your checklist, right? So that's the second part there. Um, just to review two factors, right, that determine airworthiness, uh, the type certificate, and now safe condition for operation. So who is exactly responsible for all this stuff, though? You know, who's responsible for checking its safe condition or maintaining all this uh, aircraft in airworthy condition? So the owner or operator of the aircraft is going to be the one that's responsible for maintaining an airworthy condition. So, you know, if you're going to go rent um, 8 Mike Charlie and you find something wrong with it, you know, you're not going to be the one who has to deal with the problem there. Princeton Flying School is the operator, right? They're going to be the ones responsible for maintaining that airplane in good condition. Um, however, that same FAR that we talked about earlier is going to state that the PIC, pilot in command, is going to be responsible for doing that pre-flight inspection to determine if the airplane is conditioned for safe flight. So it's up to you, the PIC, to do that. Um, it also states that you as a PIC should discontinue the flight if you notice anything on air, whether that's mechanical, electrical, or anything like that. So again, that's a PIC responsibility there. All right, so just kind of a quick overview there about airworthiness. So we're gonna go take a look at all of the required uh, documentation, inspections, and all that stuff that make up that question on your check ride in the world. They're gonna, they're gonna ask, all right, show me the airplane's airworthy. And you gotta kind of take the examiner through all these different things here, right? So we're gonna start off with required documentation that must be on board an airplane prior to flight. We use this acronym called AERO to help us remember these documents. And it's part of your pre-flight, I think it's like on the initial checklist for the checkmate ones, right? It's like you're checking these documents before you're actually even going outside to do the exterior inspection. So instead of me giving you all these, let's see um, if we know these. So does anybody know the first A over here in AERO? I think if you can unmute yourself, let's see if that's possible. I kind of cheated, but it's airworthiness. All right, there we go. Yeah, so A is the airworthiness certificate. There you go. How about the uh, first R here? What is this going to be for? Registration. Registration. All right, you got it. Now the second R, I don't, I'm trying to think. I feel like this isn't on the checkmate checklist, but it is part of the acronym that we'll uh, talk about. So Radio. anybody know what the second R is? Radio. Yeah, so we're going to be the uh, radio station license is the term. We're going to talk about that. Exactly. All right. Now we have an O. Operating handbook. Cool. Yes. Yeah, so operating handbook. Um, we'll use operating limitations again, which are found in the handbook there. And then we have a W at the end. Wait. Wait. Balance. Cool. All right. I heard two people. I think that's Andrew and Sarvam. You got it. So the weight and balance data has to be on board. So we'll talk about each one of these things here. Cool. All right. So we're going to start off with the airworthiness certificate. So what's kind of the deal with this, right? So let's say Cessna is finishing, you know, manufacturing a specific airplane. So they put together the airframe, the engine, propeller, it's all set to go. Um, this airplane would then undergo some inspections and then the FAA issues an airworthiness certificate for that specific aircraft. And basically what this means is that, all right, you know, they checked it and the aircraft meets the design and manufacturing standards that were set and it's all good to go as conditioned for safe flight over here. So here's an example of an airworthiness certificate, right? There's the registration, um, the manufacturer and model, serial number and all these different things, date of issuance. So that's your airworthiness certificate. So sometimes students will have confusion about uh, when this airworthiness certificate expires. So the airworthiness cert does not have an expiration date. It'll remain valid as long as the airplane is airworthy. So in other words, it meets those type certificate requirements and it's conditioned for safe operation. You know, all the maintenance inspections are kept up to date. So if any of those aren't there, airplane is no longer airworthy, then the airworthiness cert would no longer be valid over there. So the airworthiness cert, we also have to display it in the cabin or cockpit somewhere that is legible to passengers or crew. Um, so in a couple of slides, I'll show you guys where we keep it for our aircraft. But as long as we remember, there's actually no expiration date for the uh, airworthiness cert, as long as the airplane is still airworthy there. 
So going to the R, this is your registration certificate. You know, so same thing, just like you're registering your car uh, before an aircraft can be flown legally, we have to register it with the FAA aircraft registry. Uh, we have to keep this document, the certificate at least, inside the aircraft at all times. So you can't keep your registration for your airplane in your car at home. It's got to be in the aircraft at all times. And generally, this is valid for three years, but a temporary one, you know, when you're first applying, that'll be up to 90 days after signing before you get that uh, permanent uh, registration cert. So again, here's an example on the bottom, um, certificate of aircraft registration. There's your end number, serial number, uh, manufacturer, and then the model of the airplane, and then who it's issued to. So the name and then the address there as well. All right, so I got a notification that someone entered the uh, waiting room. I'm on it, got you. Cool, all right. All right, so that's the uh, registration. So if we take a look at this picture, um, this arrow is kind of pointing to the general location that we keep our airworthiness and registration certs on an airplane. So again, part of that pre-flight inspection, your first initial checklist is making sure that the airworthiness is present in the airplane and that your registration cert is also present but hasn't expired. So if you like take a close look at it, it'll have the date of issuance, but also the date that the registration expires. You want to make sure that's all good and it hasn't lapsed yet. All right, so the second R, um, sometimes also some confusion around this. This is the radio station license. We only need this if we are operating outside of the US or internationally. So in other words, if you are operating a US registered airplane inside the US, like, you know, just for instance, the Sky Manners, for example, you don't have to have this radio station license on board, which allows you to talk on the radios there. So just like, you know, a Niner Whiskey Romeo, the P model here, we're only flying that airplane within the US. So you're not gonna fly and uh, find a radio station license on board the airplane. Um, this is not issued by the FAA, it's issued by the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC over there. All right, so, oh, moving on to O is your operating limitations. So the operating limitations are found in your FAA approved airplane flight manual, AFM, and or the POH, right, the Pilot's Operating Handbook. We have to understand that this document is specific to the aircraft. So even though two Fox Whiskey and five for uniform are both 172R, the make and model, we can't switch them out because it's actually specific to the serial number. So for example, these two pictures below, um, this is the POH for Romeo Mike. And if you flip open to that first page, it says POH and airplane flight manual. And there's the serial number and registration for Romeo Mike right over there. And finally, we've got the weight and balance data. So this is the last part of error over here. So with the weight and balance data, you're basically looking for, you know, the basic empty weight, the arm, the moment when the airplane's empty, of course, and a, an equipment list for the airplane. Um, it's got to be current and up to date, which means you can't have a weight and balance equipment list that was, you know, produced and kept in the aircraft from like 2010. And in the last 10 years, you put in a whole set of, you know, new avionics to the airplane because the weight's going to change there. So the weight and balance data has to be current and up to date. And for all of the Princeton Flying School aircraft, we keep the weight and balance data in this aircraft papers plastic pouch here in the back of the POH there. So again, this is gonna be specific to the airplane, right? You know, Romeo Mike uh, is gonna weigh a little bit different than Mike Charlie, right? I think it's got like a different GPS or something like that, maybe autopilot or not autopilot. So we can't be switching around the weight and balance data between you know, a different R model, even though it's the same uh, make and model there. Sometimes we'll also have like a lot of confusion about what this W actually is. So yeah, it's weight and balance, but this W in required documentation isn't the same thing as you, you know, doing your weight and balance calculations at home in the POH and then bringing it to the airplane and keeping it there. So, you know, while I'm not disagreeing that you should be doing that, that's totally separate. Uh, the weight and balance data that's part of the documentation portion, at least, is, you know, these couple of papers in the back of the POH that are making sure, all right, current data, and you got your equipment list there. All right, so that is Aero. Those are your required documents that have to be on board the airplane. So make sure you check those during pre-flight. Okay. So we're gonna go into the required inspections now, right? So required inspections. 
So in addition to aero, the required documentation we just talked about, we have inspections that must be completed on airplanes. And we use this acronym AVIATED, AVIATED, to help us remember what these inspections are. So same thing, let's see if we can kind of figure this out together. Does anybody know what this first A is gonna stand for with airplane inspections? Airworthiness directives. All right, so we're that's pretty good. Yeah, exactly. So I have the last D over there is gonna be the airworthiness directives, cool. But yeah, the first one is uh, I'll say annual inspection, exactly. All right, it's pretty good there. All right, now we have a V. Anybody know what the V is for? VOR inspection. Cool. All right. You got a guess. So the V is for the VOR check or inspection there. All right. Now, instead of I, we have a number one. Anybody know what this one is for? 100 hours. All right. 100 hour inspection. Exactly. So that's going to be done there. We've got another A here. Altimeter pedo system? Yeah, you got it, exactly. So the altimeter and pedo static system also has to be tested and inspected. All right, cool. And now we have a T. Transponder. Cool. All right, you got it, Sarvam. So the T is for the transponder. All right. Now we have an E over here. And then Gab had the uh, last one as well, which was airworthiness this directive. So anybody know what the E is going to be for? Your emergency beacon. Yeah, exactly. So we're going to use the term uh, ELT, the emergency locator transmitter, right? Exactly. And uh, Gab said before, the last D is going to be for airworthiness directives. All right. So aviated, this is your inspection. So let's first talk about the annual inspection over here. So I'm pretty sure you guys can guess how often we have to do the annual inspection. Um, so we're doing this every year, every 12 calendar months. So we'll talk about that term there. But this is required for all aircraft, no matter what kind of operation you're doing. Um, every 12 calendar months. So just to make sure we're clear what a calendar month is. Say, for example, um, you know, Three Room Mike just had its annual inspection today. It's July 13th, 2021. The next annual is going to be due for that airplane on July 31st of the next year. So that'd be 2022. So that's the calendar month concept, the last day of the month. So the annual is a pretty comprehensive inspection of the airplane and the engine. Um, and basically in terms of what the mechanic has to actually check, you know, each specific airplane will have a maintenance manual. That'll list out all the stuff that the mechanic has to do. So they follow that and that'll be the annual inspection. Something else that's really, really important to note here. Uh, the annual inspection can only be done by a mechanic with an inspection authorization. We call that an IA. So again, the annual can only be completed and endorsed by a mechanic with an IA. So that's the annual over there. So if you guys are getting ready for your check ride, one of the things that the examiner is gonna ask you to do is to prove that the airplane you're taking for the flight is airworthy. And part of that is actually showing that all of these inspections, you know, aviated have been completed. So you've actually um, got to become somewhat familiar with the airplane's logs to see if, all right, you know, if the annual 100 hour, all that stuff is being done, right? So here's an example of an annual inspection being logged in an airplane's logbooks, right? Um, in terms of logbooks for inspections, generally you'll find um, two logbooks for an airplane, right? Like the first one is usually for the airframe and avionics, that kind of stuff. And the second one will be for the engine and the prop. Um, so if we take a look at this example though, for this airplane, um, we have the date right here. This annual was done on January 25th. 2020, and the first sentence says, performed annual inspection of this aircraft engine prop per the maintenance manuals of that uh, specific manufacturer, right? So again, um, each airplane will have a manual for the mechanics to kind of follow for their inspection. So if we take a look at the end here, right? The mechanics, you know, sign his name, there's a certificate number, but at the end of his number, there's that IA. So we have to remember the annual can only be done by a mechanic that holds that inspection authorization over there. So let's take a look. The annual for this uh, airplane, Rannis airplane was done on January 25th, 2020. Can anybody tell me when this would be due? What's the last date we can do this annual for the airplane?
the, the next annual you're asking, Wesley? Yeah. So if this one oh, was um, done on the, the 25th, right? Yeah. Yeah. The 31st of January, 21. Cool. Sounds good. Yeah, exactly. It'll be the last day of January for the next year. Awesome, Andrew. All right. So let's say we uh, pass that date and the annual inspection hasn't been done. Your airplane's not airworthy anymore, so too bad for you. Can't go flying. Um, there's only one instance, though, where you could go flying, and this is just for if you have to fly the airplane to a location where the annual inspection can actually be done. Let's say, for example, uh, we know Ken buys a lot of airplanes, right? Let's say Ken buys an airplane that hasn't flown in like four or five years, sitting at some remote grass strip in the middle of Pennsylvania, middle of nowhere, right? Um, and it's not airworthy, obviously, anymore. So what Ken can do, he can get a special flight permit or ferry permit here. You apply to the, uh, from the FISDO, you get a special flight permit, and it's only for the purpose of flying that airplane back to Princeton so the annual can be done over there. Um, you can't get a special flight permit, take the aircraft, go stop at Sky Manor for lunch, and then go to Princeton. It's got to be just for the purpose, you know, going directly to the place where the annual inspection can be done. So that's why we use a special flight permit in that case. All right, so that's the annual inspection. Next is gonna be uh, V. This is gonna be the VOR check, the VOR check. This is required for aircraft operating under IFR only. So again, like Niner Whiskey Romeo, we're not taking that you know, in IFR or IMC conditions. So if you take a look at the maintenance logs, you're not gonna find a VOR check uh, being done there. However, if you are operating IFR, you gotta have that VOR check done every 30 days. So that's pretty often here. And what we're doing, we're basically checking the accuracy of the airborne equipment. So there's a couple of different ways to do a VOR check that I'm not going to explain. But if you are instrument rated or if you're an instrument student, you're probably kind of familiar with this stuff over here. So when we talked about the annual inspection, we said, all right, got to be done by a mechanic with an IA. Not true for the VOR check. Um, this can actually be performed by a pilot. Uh, there's a couple ways to do it. And one of them is in the air. So a pilot can actually perform the VOR check to make sure that the equipment's OK. And just like all the other inspections, anytime you do maintenance to an airplane, we have to log it. So we also have to log the VOR check somewhere. Um, in terms of what we log, you have to log the date, the amount of error that was noted, the place it was done, and the signature. So for example, on the bottom here, this VOR check was done on April 10th, 2002. Uh, they also wrote like the kind of VOR check it was, the amount of error was two degrees. They did it on what's to be the 259 radio of the Lima, Lima Alpha VOR, wherever that is. And then finally, there is the uh, signature of the uh, person who did the VOR check. But if you know if you guys are student pilots working on your private pilot certificate, um, you're not going to have to go look for and tab the VOR check because that's IFR only. All right, so going to the 100 hour inspection, 100 hour inspection. So not all aircraft have to undergo a 100-hour inspection as well. Only aircraft being used to carry passengers for hire or for flight instruction must undergo that 100-hour inspection. So all the planes at Princeton Flying School, since we use that for flight instruction, we do those 100-hour inspections. And basically to calculate those times, we're using the time on the tachometer. So there's not going to be like any date associated with this. You know, it's not like, oh, you do the 100-hour every six months. No, you, you do the 100-hour every 100 hours. Um, so in terms of what we're checking here, for most of these smaller GA aircraft, the 100-hour inspection is like virtually the same items, at least in terms of the annual. But the main difference here, the 100-hour does not have to be done by an IA. So the annual, however, the annual that's done every 12 calendar months has to be done by a mechanic holding that IA, the inspection authorization. But a 100-hour inspection can be done by your regular old A&P mechanic. doesn't have to hold an IA. So next slide here, this is an example of what we could look for in the logs for 100 hour. So I kind of mentioned earlier that generally you'll find two separate logs for an airplane, one for the airframe, the other for the engine. And this is what we see for this particular aircraft here, right? Um, we have the tack time it was done at, which was 1583.1. There's the date. And it says, all right, 100 hour inspection completed for both the engine and prop. And then on the bottom, it's for the airframe over here. So again, if this 100 hour inspection was done at 1583.1 on the TAC, this means it would be due by 1683.1. So let's ask this though, can that limit be exceeded? So it's kind of similar in terms of what we're talking about, uh, like with the annual, right? 
So we can exceed that 100 hour limit by no more than 10 hours. And it's again, for only the purpose of flying to somewhere where you can do the inspection. Um, however, though, if you're doing this, any excess time will be subtracted from the next one. So if we put that into an example, right? Let's say eight Mike Charlie's 100 hour was due at 1489.9, but for some odd reason, we had to fly it somewhere else to do the inspection. And it was actually done at 1494.9. The next 100 hour inspection after that would still be due 100 hours from the original time. So it would be 1589.9 in this case, which is 100 hours after this original time right there. So that's the deal with the 100 hour inspection and kind of exceeding the limits over there. So 100 hour versus the annual over here, something very important. Um, the annual inspection can actually substitute or replace the 100 hour inspection but opposite does not hold true. The 100 hour does not substitute for an annual inspection. Why is this the case? It's all due to that IA. So remember the annual is done by a mechanic who I guess got a little more training, more endorsed, right? They have that inspection authorization, but the 100 hour is not, does not have to be done by that IA. It can just be a regular A and P there. So that's kind of why you can interchange only one way over there. So if you know, if you look at the logs and you can't find a hundred hour, it's probably the last annual is uh, what you're looking for. All right, so that's all about the 100 hour. We're gonna go into the altimeter and pedostatic system now. So with this test, this is required for aircraft operating, again, only IFR only. So, you know, Romeo and Mike, if we're not taking that one in IFR, you're not gonna find the altimeter and pedostatic system being checked. Um, for this though, if you are flying IFR, you gotta have it done every 24 calendar months, every 24 calendar months there. So if we take a look at this uh, example on the bottom, right, for a specific airplane, this uh, test and inspection was done on February 29th, 2016. And it's basically this first line of text says, all right, the altimeter, pedo, static, and altitude reporting system has been tested and found to be in compliance with all the necessary FARs, and it's all good to go, right? So um, you can find a whole list of what they're actually checking in that reg for, you know, like making sure the altimeter is plus or minus whatever amount of feet in terms of where you are, right? But as long as we remember, this is IFR only. So again, if you're you know, preparing for your product 26, um, you're not going to have to tab the altimeter pedostatic system since this is IFR only there. All right, so moving on to the transponder. So this is another one that's required every 24 calendar months. Um, it's only needed though, if you're in IFR. So again, if you're in class alpha airspace, um, if you're operating in class Bravo or Charlie, right? Since you need to have that Mozi transponder there. Uh, if you're over 10,000 feet or also inside that 30 nautical Mozi veil. So if you're operating at Princeton, we are actually inside that mode C of AL, so you do have to have that operating transponder and the transponder being checked. Um, so same thing in the logs, right? There's the date it was done and it's saying, all right, the ATC transponder has been tested and found to be in compliance with all the FARs over here. So if this one has to be done every 24 calendar months, and let's see, it was done on uh, the 29th of February, 2016, leap year there. I guess this would be due on the 28th of February of 2018. Kind of weird that it's like the day before, but uh, that's how it's going to work for this one. All right, so we're at the E now, the ELT, Emergency Locator Transmitter. This is required for all aircraft every 12 calendar months, just like the annual, right? This is required every 12 calendar months here. And you have to basically check the operation and battery of the unit, but um, all with mechanic, right? So another example of the logs here, um, this is actually an annual inspection. As you can see here, annual inspection completed this date, which was uh, November 1st, 2010. But usually with the annual, they'll also do the ELT since it's the same time period, right? And this line of text right here, um, where the description of the work is, it says, ELT checked as per FAR 91207, all checks okay, ELT battery expires August 2011. So again, operation's good and the battery has been inspected and it's still good, it hasn't expired yet. So that's the ELT. However, in some uh, circumstances, we actually have to replace the ELT batteries here, two of those cases. We have to replace the ELT batteries after one hour of cumulative use or if 50% of their useful life has expired. So if any one of those conditions are met, the mechanic actually has to go replace the ELT batteries over there. So that's different than doing the inspection every 12 calendar months there. 
All right, so the last one in aviated is airworthiness directives, ADs, right? And we have to ensure that all ADs are complied with. What exactly is an airworthiness directive though? So um, you kind of want to think of it as an equivalent to recall notices, like, you know, AD is like an aviation equivalent to recall notices. Um, big difference though, these are not issued by, you know, like a manufacturer, you know, Honda's not going to you know, uh, issue this. The ADs are issued by the FAA, um, so it's issued by the FAA to aircraft owners or any other persons of interest of some kind of unsafe condition created by a manufacturing defect or issue, right? Um, compliance with ADs are mandatory and it's up to the owner or operator to do so. So PIC, it's not your responsibility, but if you're the owner or operator, it is your job to comply with airworthiness directives, right? So you can see a lot of different kind of like forms or type of ADs here. Um, one, you know, it could like require just like a one-time inspection of the part. I don't know, like say some manufacturer uh, sent out an AD to say, hey, we kind of screwed up putting on the wings on your airplane. So like go check uh, one time just to make sure we put it on right. That's good enough right there. Um, another AD could, you know, require like a periodic inspection of a specific part. Um, so a good example of this, like a lot of, a lot of the older Cessna aircraft, um, I think there was like a problem with the seat track. So it kept like sliding back. It wouldn't stay locked in positions. Like a lot of older Cessna aircraft have an AD out for those. And it requires an inspection every hundred hours. Like um, maybe an older 172 model as part of the hundred hour, they will also check the seat track and make sure all the pins are, you know, secure and in proper condition there. We will also have more emergency type or urgent nature um, airworthiness directives. So this could require like a whole fleet to be grounded or the FAA could say, all right, you guys have five hours to get this work done. Otherwise the airplane's not airworthy anymore. So a couple recent examples, um, 2013, the whole 787 battery problem. Um, I think there was like a couple incidents where like the battery was catching on fire on the airplane. So the FAA decided to issue an emergency airworthiness directive and ordered everybody to ground the 787 um, until they replace the battery or something like that. Um, a more recent problem also with Boeing as well. I'm sure you guys are familiar with the uh, 737 MAX. So again, they issue an emergency ADs, um, all associated with that stuff there. So in terms of ADs, what do we actually have to log though? Same thing, you know, we have to make sure we comply with them, but the FAR is required that we keep a record of each one that we're complying with, with the airplane's logs. So here's an example, right? Um, airworthiness directive notes, compliance record. So it'll list out all of the ADs that the airplane has to comply with, you know, the date and hours of the compliance, the method of compliance, and also like the signature number of the guy who made sure it's all good. So that's ADs over there. So again, those are the required inspections that you have to do on an airplane. And we use aviated to help us remember that there. So that's an important part of airworthiness. Um, as we kind of saw though, pretty much all this stuff has to be done by some kind of mechanic. So what if it's something simple, like a very, very simple or minor fix that, you know, it doesn't really seem like we need a mechanic for. So we call this preventive maintenance, preventive maintenance, which is also um, listed on that private pilot ACS under this task. You have to be familiar with what this is here. So preventive maintenance, again, is kind of like really easy, simple maintenance operations that can be done by a certificated pilot, excluding like a student pilot or someone like that. So if you hold a private cert, you can do preventive maintenance. So a couple examples of what, you know, counts as preventive maintenance, you know, replacing the safety belts, um, cleaning spark plugs, stuff like that. But you can find a whole comprehensive list of things that count as preventive maintenance in the FARs. So part 43, we can go to over here and take a look at, all right, what counts as preventive maintenance? So, all right, um, part 43, I'm at Appendix A, which is major alterations, major repairs, and preventive maintenance right over there. So that's um, subpart C. So let me scroll down over here. Here we go. All right, so it says preventive maintenance is limited to the following work provided it does not involve complex assembly operations. So if it's something super complex and not listed here, you can't do it as a certificate pilot. So the FAA goes on to list like, I think it's 31 different things that count as preventive maintenance. If you know, you're know you kind of unsure about what you're doing as preventive maintenance, check this. If it's not on the list, it's not, you can't do it. Um, it says it pretty much says right here, it's limited to the following work over here. So that's all preventive maintenance. So if you're unsure again, you check this list in part 43 to confirm that what you're doing counts as preventive maintenance over there. So like we kind of talked about before, right? 
Um, any maintenance you're doing to an airplane, you have to log it. And the same is going to hold true for preventive maintenance over here. So if you're doing this, you've got to, again, make an entry in the maintenance record. And we've got to include the following things here. Uh, the description of the work, the date it was completed, and then your name, signature, cert number, and then the type of certificate held. So for this example over here, right, um, this was done on March 5th, 2020. The description over here, they changed the oil. And it looks like the pilot's name was I'm a be good. There's his signature. He holds a private pilot certificate and his cert number is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. All right. Cool. So that's uh, your maintenance and inspections over there. So remember, aviated for your inspections. That's the acronym to know. So next up, we're going to go into required equipment, required equipment for day VFR and also night VFR. Uh, there's also an acronym for IFR. If you guys are, you know, any instrument students here or instrument radio, so you guys know grab card. Uh, we're not going to cover that for today, although we're just going to go day and night VFR. So the regulation concerning this is 91205. So you definitely want to you know, know that number. Remember that. Okay, this is the required equipment. So for day VFR, we use the acronym A Tomato Flames, or you know, some kind of variation of that. I've heard a couple of times, but use A Tomato Flames for day VFR. And for night, we're gonna use the acronym FLAPS. So F-L-A-P-S. That does not mean we have to have flaps at night to operate. That's just the acronym over there. So let's start off with the day VFR A tomato flames over here. So it's a pretty long list. Instead of me uh, kind of giving each one of these, let's see if we can do this together and fill in A tomato flames for day VFR acquired equipment. So I've got a picture of the um, 172 uh, flight deck over here with all the different things. Uh, just remember though, that not everything in A tomato flames you're gonna see in this picture. So um, yeah, if you guys wanna just like start calling things out, see if we can fill this in. I'm just gonna like go back to the uh, edit mode or something here so we can start typing it in. Can you guys still see this though? Altimeter. Perfect. Yep. All right, you got it, Andrew. So the altimeter, that's gonna be a required instrument in day VFR. All right, so altimeter, pretty solid. All right, what else do we have here in eight tomato flames? Tachometer. Cool, yeah, that's tachometer. So we have to have a tach uh, for each engine. All right, let's see, what else do we have here? Oil pressure. Cool, you guys are, um, so the oil pressure gauge also has to be operating. Hmm, anybody know the M here? Manifold pressure. Yeah, exactly. You got it, Andrew. So the manifold pressure gauge. So do we have that in the uh, 172R, though? No. Exactly. Yes, we don't have this. Don't have that constant speed prop, unfortunately. So, all right, no manifold pressure gauge then. Okay. Um, got some more A's here. We can do this out of order as well. Let's see. Airspeed. All right, good, good thinking there. Airspeed indicator. Um, I'm sure some of you or maybe a couple of you have had that experience of uh, you do your pre-takeoff briefing, you add power and you start rolling down the room and you're flying right rudder and you notice that the airspeed indicator needle is stuck and you abort your takeoff. So why do we do that? Because we need a functioning airspeed indicator in day VFR. Cool. All right, uh, what do we have next? Mm, all right. So this T is going to be for the temperature gauges. Um, this is not to be confused with the oil temperature. So temperature gauges are required for liquid cooled engines. But in our airplane, we have air cooled engines, right? So we don't have to have uh, temperature gauges there. Right, I'll fill that in. Cool. All right. We have another O here. This one's uh, related to the other one we had before. Oil temperature. There we go. You got a gap. So this one's the uh, oil temperature gauge. All right. Cool. So now we have flames. Um, no, it does. All right. No, we don't want to have fire on board the airplane, but we have the rest of the acronym to fill in. So F, what is this going to be for? Fuel gauges. Yeah, fuel gauges. We have to have uh, operating fuel gauges on the airplane there. Um, so with the fuel gauges, it doesn't have to be like, in a sense, 100%, like always working, you know, sometimes in some airplanes, you'll see it like maybe it takes a while to properly show all the way full or it'll like flicker a little bit. But you know, as long as it's you know, working, maybe after a couple minutes, you're going to be good there. So fuel gauges. All right. We have an L. Uh, fuel 
think it's I think it's landing lights. That's a very good guess. So the landing lights we will see in the night VFR. Okay. So I'll give you guys a hint. For the L and A tomato flames, we do not have this on the 172R. But you do have this on a 172RG. Landing gear? Something with landing gear? Yeah. So landing gear position indicator. We got to know if uh, gear's up or down, basically, right? So landing gear position indicator. All right. Cool. Now, one more A. Um, this one can sometimes be a little confusing as well. So this A is for the anti-collision light system, anti-collision light system. Oops. So um, does anybody know what makes up the anti-collision light system in the 172 picture here? Your strobes? Cool, yeah, so the strobe lights, exactly. And then I think, um, I forget what kind of document, but yeah, the beacon as well. So strobes and beacon yeah, is gonna make beacon. up the, uh, exactly the anti-collision light system there for the airplane. So both those have to be working. All right, now we've got uh, three more items here. You guys doing pretty good for eight tomato flames. So we have an M, another one here. So I just noticed it's actually not in this picture that I got. <laughs> yeah, your magnetic compass. Cool, you got it, the magnetic compass, exactly. So I gotta have that. All right, and two more things. ELT. ELT, all right, sounds good. Um, just a quick note on that. So that one is 91207, I believe, governs ELT stuff. There's certain operations where you actually don't have the have to have an ELT operating. And I think one of those is if you're operating, um, doing like training operations within a 50 nautical mile radius of the airport where it began. So if your airplane is only being used for that, I think legally we don't have to have an operating ELT. So just something uh, interesting there. All right. And we have an S. One more thing here. Also not pictured. Uh, safety belts. All right, I like that you said safety belts. That's exactly it there, Andrew, so safety belts. Cool, so that's eight tomato flames. These are the things we have to have on board for day VFR. Um, so let me just kind of get back to the uh, full screen presentation uh, view over here, if we can figure that out. Okay, so the next slide here, um, list that out again with some uh, different specifics that I'll kind of talk about. Um, let's see. So we talked about how the tack is needed for each engine. Same thing for the oil pressure gauge for each engine. Um, let's see what else we didn't mention here. Okay, so I think the FAR is they word it as a magnetic direction indicator. That's just the compass. ELT we just talked about, right? That's uh, 91 to a seven is if it's required by that operation. And then the SD safety belts, um, there's also one more part. It's and shoulder harnesses for front seats if your plane's manufactured after 1978. So I think um, all of them are PFS are, so we also have to have shoulder harnesses for the front seats over there. All right, so that's eight tomato flames. Pretty good there for day VFR. So next we're gonna go into night VFR. We're gonna try the same thing. Um, so something to remember with night VFR, it's not just these five things in flaps. It's actually everything in eight tomato flames. So day VFR plus these things. So I'm gonna go back to that uh, other view. Does anybody know the first uh, part of this acronym, the F? Flashlight. Uh, sorry, say that one more time for you, John. Uh, flashlight. Flashlight, all right, that's a pretty good guess over there. I'd say um, pretty important to bring a flashlight. I would, I would definitely do that. That's actually fuses is what the uh, first F is gonna be here. Um, so I'll go into the uh, kind of specific wording afterwards, but yeah, fuses, all right. Now, the rest of the things, um, actually the next three things I should say have to deal with lights though. So I think Andrew, earlier you mentioned landing lights. So the L and flaps is gonna be for landing lights over here, but there's something uh, specific we'll talk about after with this one. Um, anybody know the A in flaps? We actually mentioned this earlier in A tomato flames. Anti-collision lights. You got it, Sarvin. So this is again, the anti-collision light system. Um, why does it appear in this again? I think it's uh, has something to do with 
I'm trying to remember the date. I think it was like airplane certificated before March 11, 1996, something like that. Um, didn't have to have the anti-collision light system in daytime, but they have it at night. So that's kind of why it appears here. So anti-collision lights. All right. What about the P over here? Position lights, the red and the green. Position lights. Yeah, exactly. You got to get position lights. So the red, green, and white on the airplane. Um, so on the 172 R at least in your lights, we call them the navigation lights, right? So nav and position lights for the exact same thing. And we have one more, we have an S. Anybody know this? All right, so the S in flaps is gonna be source of electricity, source electricity. So let's see, does anybody know what would be the source of electricity in our airplane, the 172 hour? What would that be? Your alternator and your battery. Cool, you got it, Andrew, exactly. So the alternator, that's probably what I would consider as the source of electricity since that's actually what's charging the uh, battery, right? So yeah, the alternator, very good. All right, so uh, let me reset up the uh, screen again here so it gets back into the presenter view. And we'll go to the uh, following slide here. But yeah, that's exactly it. So night VFR is going to be eight tomato flames plus flaps. So let's kind of get just a little more specific with um, a couple of these. So we mentioned the first thing was fuses, right? Um, I think the regulation that says one spare set of fuses or it's three fuses of each kind required. And it's also got to be accessible to the pilot in flight. So it can't be like in you know, the baggage department, you can't reach that. However, do we have fuses in our airplanes in Princeton Flying School? We do not. So if we don't have fuses, we don't have to worry about that. Um, we all have circuit breakers. How do we reset those? You push it in. So that's nice and easy, right? So we don't have to worry about you know, like a spare set of fuses in this case. Um, the LD landing light, which we talked about, this is actually for hire only. So if you're not operating for a hire at night, illegally, you don't have to have the landing light. Um, I remember this one very vividly because I got this wrong on my oral exam during the private pilot check right when Bill Wheaton asked me this. And yeah, see, so landing light is for hire only over there. Okay. Um, we talked about the anti collision and position lights. And just like Andrew said before, the source of electricity, we're going to uh, think of it as the alternator. All right, so that's your day and night VFR required equipment, eight tomato flames and flaps. So now let's say though you're doing your pre-flight inspection and you notice something is not working, something is not working. What do we do? So this is um, an area that gets kind of confusing for um, a lot of students and a lot of certificated pilots too. But we're gonna talk about this. So inoperative equipment and instruments. So the regulation is 91.213. I know I'm kind of throwing a lot of numbers, um, but all right, whatever. So let's uh, think of the situation over here. Let's say it's 10 o'clock in the morning, so it's daytime, and you are doing your pre-flight inspection on, I don't know, let's think of an airplane, uh, two Fox Whiskey. All right, and we notice that the landing lights are inoperative, right? You're doing your initial checks, you're doing your lights, and you say, oh my goodness, your landing light's not working. So can we legally fly that airplane knowing that the landing lights are not working? Okay. So let's figure out how to approach this here. Um, so overall, the answer is yes, under some uh, kind of uh, circumstances that we'll go over. So the first question we have to ask ourselves is, does my airplane have a minimum equipment list, an MEL? Anybody know what an MEL is by any chance? I know it's in the POH. I don't know if that's what you're asking. <laughs> okay, um, I think what you're thinking of is the possibly is the comprehensive equipment list in the weight and balance section possibly uh, there's there's something similar to that we'll, we'll go over that as well um so the mel pretty much none of these small g aircraft will have an mel here um, but you know the owner operator could issue an mel to you know their specific airplane um but it's basically like an easy way to think about it is it's a list, list of things that can be broken, but you can still fly the airplane. So it'll have like different equipment in it and it'll have provisions. Like, all right, you know, you can fly this airplane under this condition if you know you do certain things. So, but if the answer is yes to that question, if you do have an MEL, you follow the provisions in the MEL to determine if your airplane is good to go. And if it says you're airworthy, go flying and you're all good to go, right? However, um, 
student pilots, the airplanes we're flying, right, we're not going to have MELs. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a look at that regulation subpart delta to kind of figure this out. There's a good flow chart, the kind of idea we want to use here. So this next slide is all about dealing with inoperative equipment without an MEL. So the first thing we have to do is ask ourselves four questions. I know it's like kind of an annoying process here, but uh, four different things we have to take a look at. So the first thing, is the equipment required by 91205? So that was eight tomato flames and flaps. So let's go back to that scenario. We said it's daytime and two Fox Whiskey's landing lights are not working. So we would look at that eight tomato flames, 91205, right? And say, okay, is the landing light in there? And we go through and say, oh, okay, it's actually not. So, all right, check. We're good to go. It's not required. Next thing, is the equipment required by any airworthiness directives? Um, probably not going to be an AD related to the landing light, but you can again check that and your logs and also the FAA's directory for airworthiness directives. So I'll kind of show you guys right now if we uh, click this here. ADs. Oh, let me uh, go back to the previous oh, slide. Lord. So here is um, the FAA site for ADs. So you have a database for all this, uh, all these current airworthiness directives, right? We can look at all current ADs by make and model. So why don't we look at, uh, we'll pick on the uh, Piper wing spar scenario here. So P and let's find Piper aircraft. Let's look at the uh, PA-28-161, the uh, Cherokee over here. And here are all your ADs that uh, are current applied to the airplanes. So like here's the uh, one for the Piper wing spar. So if you click on that, you'll, you can read all the ADs. But, you know, they have a subject over here. So what you can kind of do, I guess, is like look for anything related to a landing light. Um, we can do the same for the 172, right? So we look for Textron Aviation, um, since that's the company that sells the airplane. We can find 172R, since that's what Two Fox Whiskey is. And we check these to make sure that the landing light is not required by any of these. And probably not going to be. Um, so, again, this would be a comprehensive check, but uh, we know landing light is all good to go. So third part, is the equipment required by either the aircraft's equipment list or the kinds of operation equipment list? So those are two different things. Um, so let's go over the first one, though, the equipment list. I think, Andrew, this is probably what you are referring to before. So the equipment list for our aircraft, um, we can find this in section six of the POH, which is your weight and balance and equipment list. So I've got kind of like a um, PDF version of the PIM. So let me go to that page here. So here's your comprehensive equipment list. It says the following figure is a comprehensive list of all Cessna equipment, which is available for the model 172 R airplane. And it goes on to say anything that has a suffix letter R is a required item. So what we have to do now, we go through this list and find the landing light and make sure that there is no R next to the item number. So like, um, for example, let's find something with an R over here. The pilot seat that is required to be in the airplane. Probably a good idea over there. Um, all right, so let's uh, keep scrolling down and see if we can find lights. All right, 33 lights over here. So the bottom one, landing and taxi light installation wings. And we see the item number ends with an S. So that's standard equipment, but is it required? That's actually not required there. So that means, okay, the equipment is not required by our equipment list. Um, again, all these airplanes you're flying are probably not going to have the second one, kinds of operation equipment list. But if you do have an airplane and your POH has a kinds of operation equipment list in section two for limitations, um, this basically, again, relatively self-explanatory. It'll have a list of equipment that's required for, all right, this is for day VFR. You need this in night VFR. You need this in IFR and so on over there. So that's your kinds of operation equipment list. But for our purposes, for our airplane, we don't have um, that document there. So we use just the equipment list. And finally, the last part is the equipment required by the VFR day type certification. This one's also a little bit weird, but as long as we remember this part is just relating to that type certificate data sheet, that TCDS. In the beginning of the presentation, that the webinar we talked about, the type certificate, right? And looking at the TCDS. So basically um, you wanna make sure again, landing light is not required there and it's not listed. So now we said that the landing light is not required by all four of these things. So we said no to all of these questions. 
So in that case, we have to remove or deactivate and placard an operative. So I'm sure you guys have seen on a couple of term coordinators, I forget the airplanes, but like, like Tri, for example, has an inoperative sticker on the turn coordinator. So basically what we did with that, we deactivated and placarded an operative because again, it's not required by any of these uh, four things there. And then the final step is the pilot or mechanic has to determine it's safe to fly. Let's go with another example. Say it was like the attitude indicator. Um, and we checked those four conditions. We said, all right, you're all good. We, you know, placarded an operative. If it's a clear sky day and, you know, if your attitude is not working, all right, Go for it. You know, you just look outside. Good enough. But, you know, maybe it's like marginal VFR conditions, you know, low visibility and ceilings. So legally, yeah, you know, you're, you're good to go. It's not required by those things, but probably not the best idea um, to fly that airplane. So I probably wouldn't be considered safe. Now, let's say, though, that whatever piece of equipment we're looking at, we answered yes to any of these questions. So it doesn't have to be all. It doesn't have to be required by all of these things. It could be required by just the equipment list, just 91205 or something like that airplane is not going to be good to go. So you can't fly. It's not airworthy anymore until you get some kind of uh, inspection and maintenance done over there. So this is the kind of flow you want to use to deal with inoperative equipment. So this slide is going to be pretty important. Um, this is often like a weak area for student pods, especially you know, on that private pod checker. I definitely remember I was not too great with this regulation back then, but it's starting to make more sense now, which is good. Uh, but remember this, there's like a bunch of flow charts online that are good to help you kind of uh, visualize what you're checking here. But as long as you remember, all right, we do not have MELs for the airplane. And when you look at those four things, and if you're good to go, you placard an operative and you determine safe to fly there. All right. So the next thing I had over here was kind of like another situation. Um, let's say it's nighttime. It's 10 p.m. You're doing your inspection on another 172, but this time you notice the oil pressure gauge is inoperative. And we kind of work through the same thing. So first thing, do we have an MEL for the 172? No, we do not. So we would go through the four steps again. First one is, all right, is it required by 91205, eight tomato flames? And we go through that and say, hmm, okay, flaps. There's no oil pressure gauge. We're good to go. Not exactly. So remember though, Night VFR, we also have to include a tomato flames. It's not just flaps. So if we look at a tomato flames, the oil pressure gauge is actually there. And at this point, we can just stop there. We don't have to continue, right? We know that, all right, well, the oil pressure gauge was actually required to be uh, functioning from 91 to 5. And we answered yes. So the airplane's not airworthy anymore. So you got to wait uh, to fly there, basically. So that's how we deal with inoperative equipment over there. All right. So that's kind of all I have for the uh, content of airworthiness requirements. That pretty much actually covers um, everything in this task for the ACS. I don't think there's uh, like any additional things, but that's uh, airworthiness requirements. So if you guys are kind of familiar with this stuff, you should be all good to go for your uh, Part 26 oral exam there. So, all right. Does anybody have any uh, questions about anything we talked about today? So we discussed required documents. Um, we talked about inspections, equipment, and also dealing with inoperative equipment, right? Um, before I forget, um, let me let me see if I can send this uh, in the chat, if I can figure out how to pull that up over here. I typed up um, like a short Word doc with the acronyms. You guys just have in like one spot rather than looking everywhere. Um, all right, but in the meantime, yeah, we can do uh, any kind of questions. Where would you find the radio from Arrow, the radio um, requirement, re registration? Uh, the, the second R, right? The radio station yeah, the license? R. Yeah, where, okay. like, where would you find that physically? Or that is a good question. Um, I'm pretty sure that's also got to be in the aircraft. As a matter of fact, it does actually. So it's got to be in the airplane itself. Um, there's actually another component to that that I didn't discuss. Not too important though. But not only does the airplane have to have a radio station license, you, the pilot, actually have to apply for like a radio telephone operator permit from the FCC to be able to talk on the radios internationally there. But yeah, that'd be in the airplane. I've never seen one, though, so I'm not really sure uh, what it looks like. You mean you haven't flown internationally yet? Unfortunately, yeah. On the list, on the list. Yeah, exactly. Okay, here we go. So, Oh, you know what? I think I just... Uh, well, I sent the document in the chat, but I just noticed I had Sargon selected. So it was just a direct message to him. Let me, uh, let's change that. All right. Anybody else have any other uh, questions here? 
I, I got a question about that uh, VFR day type certification thing. I was always fuzzy about that one. I mean, when is that going to be, when is, it, when is an item going to be required on the VFR day type certification, but then not on the, uh, on the uh, required equipment with the POH uh, required equipment list? Exactly. I have the exact same thought as you. It, it just does not make any sense to me why they would have that as a separate item. Um, but that's what they have in the regulations. Yeah, I've always kind of been like, this doesn't really make sense why I would not be on one thing and then the other. But yeah, it's it's kind of an odd thing. Um, so unfortunately, I don't have a good answer for you there. All right, well, I sent down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm just uh, that VFR day type certification is pretty basic stuff, right? It's like four or five different things, like kind of obvious stuff, like, you know, propeller and stuff like that. Yeah. I mean, that's exactly just the TCDS, right? Whatever it's being listed in there. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's going to be there. Yeah. All right. So I sent that document though in the um, chat. So that should contain uh, some of the acronyms we talked about. Okay, I got a message here from Sarvam, another good question. He said he saw a um, little bit of damage on the right wing of an airplane he was pre-flighting, and he's asking, how is that airplane still airworthy over there? Um, so this goes back to that condition for safe operation part. So it's up to the PIC um, to make the determination if you know the airplane is in condition for safe operation. So Sarvam, if you were the PIC, that would be up to you to decide. So if it's like, I don't know, like a super, super small bumper scratch, then not a big deal there. Um, but if you were a student, uh, it would be up to the uh, CFI in that case, since they'd be acting as PIC to determine if you're still good to go and airworthy. So that's a pretty good question though. Wesley, on the, mm -hmm. on the AD compliance record, where is that with the uh, aircraft logbooks or is it somewhere else? Good question. Um, with all of the aircraft we have, we keep it um, as well with the aircraft logbooks. Like if you go ask, um, you know, before you check, right, if you go ask for the log for like Mike Charlie um, in the kind of what is it binder we keep for, you'll find the airframe logs, engine logs, and also like a separate folder for ADD compliance records. All right. Any other uh, questions here? Or how about this? Any suggestions for the next one? Are we looking for topics? Yeah, possibly. I mean, I think what I have kind of right now is like going through the uh, oral exam topics in the ACS for private pod. But if anybody wants something specific or, you know, we can switch, switch that up for sure. I like that one. <laughs> Hopefully Andrew will land just at the perfect timing for us. <laughs> yeah, that would be good. <laughs> When are you planning to do that with next month? <laughs> yeah, what, Wesley, I think that's his next next month. Next month, yeah. I would say that one more time. You said the oral exam one you're planning for next month. Oh no, what I'm what I'm saying it's like the topics that I've been covering for like the last couple months are the topics in the ACS for the oral exam. So it's like I'm kind of going through um basically like private pie ground school, I guess you'd call it. But um hmm. Did, did I mean, that'd be that's a good idea, actually, doing like a mock oral exam, but that's more of like a one-on-one -on -one thing, I'd say. But yeah. all right, yeah. We can did put you Andrew in the hot seat and the rest can just walk. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah right. no, no thanks. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody wants to volunteer for that, that could be good. Yeah. <laughs> did did we do one on weather briefing or pre-flight weather? Is that we have not. I, I have weather information planned in somewhere. That'll be good to talk about. I know everybody, well, at least some people say, gotta call the briefer. Um, all right, I'll, I'll just I'll side note with that. Anybody know what advisory circulars are? Definitely. So, yeah, the F. I mean, the FAA issues them. They're kind of like they're non-regulatory. They're just like you know, little articles, not articles, like documents to help us kind of interpret or follow the regulations. A um, couple months ago, they released one, and it was like all about weather briefings. Um, and generally, what they're actually saying was they're kind of encouraging us as pods to do soft briefings instead. And it was kind of like, just call the briefer on an as needed basis. It was, it was like, uh, if you're stranded in the middle of nowhere, you don't have internet, call them. But I think they're uh, suggesting that we use other means instead of getting a weather briefing. But that's definitely a good idea. We can um, do one on the whole weather briefing process, cross country planning, all that kind of deal. Okay. Sounds good. And if anyone thinks of um, a subject, you can always call or email or when you're at the front desk, just leave a note and we can uh, make that happen as well. 
Great. All right. Sounds good. So let me, uh, let me ask you this. Would it be a good idea to make these like presentations available somehow, like put the link to it in the description of the YouTube video? I think or would so. that be pointless? I don't know. I mean, like the PowerPoints, like would it be yeah, possible for right. students to click through the PowerPoints? Right. This is when you can answer. That would be good. Yeah, definitely okay. good. Yeah. I remember the last one I did, um, We like the whole second half was on weight and balance and I had an Excel file um, mm -hmm. with that. I think I sent it in the chat. I'm not sure if it's made its way up onto the website or anything, but yeah, that's something we can definitely figure out to kind of get these resources all um, posted. Yeah, I think that'd be a great idea. Mm -hmm. Then you can go back, click through. Right, yeah. Yeah, good thinking. All right. Well, anything else anyone has? No uh, quiet you, crowd tonight. Thank you very much, Chris. Yeah, another great. Of course. Class. All right. Wesley. Thank you very much, Andrew and John. Appreciate it. Thank you, Wesley. It was awesome. Of course. Thanks, Thanks for joining us, Sir Vong. Did you enjoy it, Michael? Yes, thank you. Hopefully, it's not too boring. Uh, All right, that's good to hear. <laughs> They're good. They're good. Cameras are off, but enthusiasm is there. All awesome. Right. Thank you thank you so much for uh, leading us through that. That was great. Yeah, of course. You got it. Happy to do it. Keeps my nod fresh too. It's good. Yeah. Good. Very useful session. Thank you. Of course. Appreciate it. Thanks for tuning in. Hi, Erwin. I hope there's no birds in your plane. Oh, I have the saddest <laughs> news for you. I, I don't know if I told you, but... Uh, I waited a week so that they would move out, grow up and move out, but uh, they died in there. Oh my God. Oh, no. Sorry. Terrible. So did you get them out? Yeah, well, I got their corpses out. Oh my God. He had birds in his wings. Oh, oh man. What, what kind of airplane was it? Or is it? The Piper, you know, what happened was there's a counterweight for the, uh, for, the, uh, for the ailerons and they got in through the hole where the counterweight comes in and out. And the thing about it is wow. when I discovered them in there, uh, I think I moved the ailerons and, I, and the counterweight ended up blocking the, uh, the uh, hole that they were using to get in and out. So, so I, think they, um, I think it was a horrible, real downer. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to do that. That's, uh, you know, <laughs> it, it was a great session. <laughs> <laughs> didn't, didn't mean to end it like that. And we killed some birds in the airport. <laughs> no, it's good. Thanks for updating us on the story. I was curious what happened. So it was good. All right. Well, right. until next time, if you have pilot stories you want to share at the end, that's always fun too. Because we can find idea. out about, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, air, uh, birds and airplanes and anything else. Like, uh, love a good story. And uh, thanks everyone for, sh for tuning in. All right. Thank you very much, everybody. Yeah. Thanks all. Good night. Yeah, thank all you. right. Have a good night, everybody. Hopefully, we'll get some uh, good weather soon. Yeah. 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 Gotta fix that, will you? Go <laughs> <laughs> talk to those weather briefers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. I don't know. We've been doing these tasks terrible. <laughs> All right. Happy flying, okay. everyone. All right. Have a good night. Have a good night, everybody. Take care. Bye, Bye Wesley. Thank you. All right. You got it. Have a good night. Bye, Andrew. Bye, Gab. <laughs>